With recent numbers quoted of 500,000 long COVID sufferers in the UK alone, and by case extrapolation up to 4 million more across the US and Europe, recovery is going to be a huge issue around the world. But how do we treat and then recover from something we don't really understand? Not really a question enough people are asking. But I'm going to try. First of all, we have to ask the rather unpleasant question, just how likely is a total recovery? How confident can we be of getting better when we don't really understand what's going on? There are plenty of glib comments from doctors and GPs out there saying that sufferers will get better. Uh, and we would expect people to get better. But given that we've got no clinical research yet into what's causing the condition, I'm not entirely sure how they can be quite so confident. The closest parallel we've got are studies from SARS-1 that showed that 40% of people were still not recovered after three years. Pretty grim numbers. Is that what we're going to be looking at for SARS-2? Well, not necessarily. SARS-1 was actually a pretty nasty virus and caused uh, greater severity of symptoms and more longer lasting damage in a greater proportion of people who are infected. Studies have shown that post-viral fatigue after other viruses like Epstein-Barr and Ross River tends to clear after about a year. And in severe cases, the immune system does tend to calm down after three years. So what are we actually dealing with here? We maybe need to break down what long COVID actually is, uh, and then we can start to take a look at what our chances actually are. I'm gonna go out on a bit of a limb here and talk about what I think is going on. Here's a table showing the most commonly reported symptoms of long COVID. What the hell kind of single condition can do all this? Well, my recent study of 1850 long haulers found that you can portion these symptoms off into groups, and between those groups, it was a spectrum of responses in terms of symptoms experienced. 24% experiencing post-viral fatigue type symptoms, 28% experiencing what felt like ongoing viral symptoms, and the remainder experiencing both. So what's physically going on here? My feeling is that long COVID has a foundation of classical post-viral fatigue. These are the ME type symptoms that people have been reporting on. The vast majority of people suffering from long COVID have some degree of this going on, a systemic inflammation caused by a hyperactive immune system. But then on top of that, depending on how lucky or unlucky you are, there are a medley of further issues you could experience. Let's start with endocrine system malfunction. This is SARS-2's ability to mess with your hypothalamus, creating hormonal, body regulation, and neurological issues. Next, histamine intolerance and potentially mast cell activation syndrome. Seems to make sense. Uh, I think I have had some of this. Exaggeration of any other potentially undiagnosed uh, existing intolerances or deficiencies. Uh, for the most severely affected, uh, organ damage to lungs, kidney, liver, heart, uh, all from the virus itself and all very possible given the vascular nature of the disease. And let's not forget the incredibly widely reported impact on mental health, leading to very high rates of depression and anxiety. Is this a consequence of the life-changing uh, nature of the condition itself or potentially is there actually some direct impact from the virus on our brain chemistry? Possibly both. So when we look at all the different ways that long COVID can affect the body, it starts to give us some idea of how and why we can see these crazy array of symptoms. Still though, big question, when there's this much going on, how do you get better? And how on earth do you treat it? Let's take a look at the current advice that's out there. Here's the NHS's website for your COVID recovery. They talk about the three P's, pace, plan and prioritise. Good advice. Anything you shouldn't do? Well, yes, graded exercise therapy. Good that this issue is now being addressed properly. And if you want some more detailed advice, go to the specialists. I've linked to the ME Association before. Their advice is absolutely spot on, although arguably it only deals with the foundation of the long COVID condition, that of post-viral fatigue. It's not a good use of your time for me to read through all this now. Uh, the link is in the description. I highly recommend doing everything they say, to be quite honest. Another very useful set of assets are the series of films that Professor Copeland and the recover team at Sheffield Hallam University have made along with the Cresta unit at Newcastle Hospital. They address the subject of recovery from fatigue and use their professional experience in treating chronic fatigue created by other conditions 
Professor Copeland does make the point that these treatments are based on the healthcare provider's professional experience of chronic fatigue rather than research into long COVID itself. Moving on to the clinical side, this paper by Tricia Greenhalg and her team sets out recommendations for how primary healthcare providers should handle long COVID patients. Some highlights. The long-term course of COVID-19 is unknown. Caution is advised as patients may present atypically and new treatments are likely to emerge. Clinical testing is not always needed, but can help to pinpoint causes of continuing symptoms and to exclude conditions like pulmonary embolism or myocarditis. Management of COVID-19 after the first three weeks is currently based on limited evidence. Since many people were not tested and false negative tests are common, we suggest that a positive test for COVID-19 is not a prerequisite for diagnosis. This is what I've been harping on about for ages. After excluding serious ongoing complications or comorbidities, and until the results of long-term follow-up studies are available, patients should be managed pragmatically and symptomatically with an emphasis on holistic support while avoiding over-investigation. In our experience, most but not all patients who are not admitted to hospital recover well with four to six weeks of light aerobic exercise, such as walking or pilates, gradually increasing in intensity as tolerated. I will take some issue with this final point. I don't know how many patients were seen in this context for, um, for this paper to draw these conclusions, but this does not seem to be an experience that's necessarily replicated across the long haul groups, where the vast majority of sufferers are still suffering 20 weeks in without any significant improvement to date. As for exercise, pending direct evidence from research studies, we suggest that it should be undertaken cautiously and cut back if the patient develops fever, breathlessness, severe fatigue or muscle aches. So that's not rocket science. Uh, so far, most of this advice has been around behavioural management. What about treatment? Uh, and if we look at the most common symptom, that's of fatigue. We found no published research evidence on the efficacy of either pharmacological or non-pharmacological interventions on fatigue after COVID-19. I'm really, really hoping that we do start to see some proper research on this front in the coming months. Humans have been attempting to treat all sorts of ailments with various concoctions since the year dot. Just recently we discovered that Ball's eye salve, a medieval onion and garlic remedy, is in fact an effective antibiotic. But that doesn't mean that just because someone on the internet says something cures Covid, it actually does. So when it comes to supplements, I will just say this. If you have an existing intolerance or deficiency, don't be surprised if long COVID has made it worse. So if you need to get over-the-counter supplements in safe and legal doses, then go ahead. We may ultimately find that yes, certain supplements do alleviate certain symptoms or perhaps treat the condition itself. But until we've got the research to back that up, I'm not going to go all forsythia on you. But what about over-the-counter drugs? Well, that BMJ piece mentions paracetamol or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs for fever and the same would apply to headache. Feel like you're way more allergic than you should be? I certainly did. Um, in which case, try some antihistamines and vary the brands because they don't all work in exactly the same way. If you're still struggling, uh, talk to your GP and they might be able to prescribe something a little bit stronger. Now, when it comes to treatment, I'm actually going to put my neck on the line and talk about a big one from my personal experience. And that is corticosteroids. Dexamethasone and prednisolone are the most commonly used for inflammatory conditions. About three weeks ago, I was prescribed dexamethasone after my skin became so inflamed and painful all over that I couldn't actually move without being in agony. I also had a huge eczema flare-up and broken skin everywhere. It was horrendous. Uh, my bed sheets looked like something out of basic instinct, uh, and that's without even needing the UV light. Very impressive. And after about three days, along with a sizable dose of an antihistamine, fexofenadine, my skin cleared right up. What was interesting is that it wasn't just my skin that cleared up, because the fatigue lifted too. Not only did that fatigue lift, but also the speed limits, those invisible energy budget limits that you can't exceed without having an awful post-exertional malaise relapse. I could have degrees of activity in a day that might previously have caused a relapse, but now there was no consequence. Not just that, but uh, I went from drinking four pints of water a night with raging nocturnal thirst to actually drinking less than a pint, even when it was really, really hot. Why? What was going on? 
Well, the fatigue part of long COVID is fundamentally caused by this systemic inflammation caused by a hyperactive immune system. This is fairly well acknowledged. All that water I was drinking was simply just pumping up the inflammation in my body and my body just was craving more and more. And what the steroids were doing, being immunosuppressants, was simply just damping all of that down and reducing the inflammation and thus reducing the fatigue. But unfortunately there is a but here. Um, those few days were short-lived because the side effects from steroids can be brutal. Steroids are not nice drugs. Uh, the side effects uh, I experienced in ascending order of impact were this uh, sort of raging angry hunger, just growling away in your stomach that always wants to be fed, um, a degree of agitation bordering on mania, um, and then finally this crippling insomnia that meant I was only getting three, four, five hours sleep a night. Whilst I was on the steroids, the agitation, that level of alertness uh, caused by them meant I could get through. But as I started tapering down and coming off them towards the end of the course, the insomnia stayed um, and the alertness started to leave. And by the time I finished the course of steroids, I had this huge cumulative sleep deficit that I then brought back into this world of inflammatory fatigue again. Um, so once I came off the steroids, I was essentially wiped out for four days. And those are just the short-term side effects. Long-term side effects of extended courses are serious and can be permanent. So I can't say I recommend taking them. Certainly don't go down to your GP and pester them for a prescription saying that some guy on YouTube recommended it, because I don't. But the reason I bring it up is because I think it tells us something about the nature of the condition when a pharmacological intervention like this can have this kind of impact on the symptoms. Is it possible that in a certain affected cohort, a course of steroids could actually put the brakes on the hyperactive immune system for good and put long COVID in the bin? Maybe. I reached out on the long COVID support groups to see if anybody else out there had had a similar experience. And I spoke to about 10 people who had also taken courses of steroids for various reasons. And they all reported some degree of improvements on various of their long COVID symptoms whilst they were on the course of steroids. And some of them reported improvement persisting after they'd finished. My point here only is this. We need to have clinical studies on possible treatments to establish efficacy and safety. But it seems like along with the study that shows that dexamethasone uh, reduced mortality in severely ill patients, there may also be some treatments at some stage in the right doses and in the right combinations that could help us with long COVID. We just need to have the right clinical studies done so that we can actually assess just how effective and safe those treatments are. Will we have that data and conclusion soon enough to help the people out there who are suffering at the moment? Who knows? Okay, so I'm going to attempt some practical advice, but one of the things I will say is this. It's very important to understand that long COVID is not a homogenous experience. Everybody's experience and symptomatic combinations are kind of unique within this spectrum. For those experiencing this side of the spectrum of symptoms, uh, I think all I would like to say is do whatever you can to rest and look after your symptoms. I think it's premature to say that uh, treatment or management should be X, Y or Z when we don't necessarily know exactly what are causing each of these symptoms um, in each individual case. But what about this side of the spectrum, the basic engine of long COVID? Crippling fatigue, headaches, brain fog, insomnia, dizziness, neurological symptoms. Well, firstly, I'm going to say, do your best to know yourself. That is to say, understand what fatigues you, probably both physical and cognitive exertion, but in what balance? For me personally, I have a higher tolerance of physical exertion than cognitive effort. So that means I can faff about, go to the shops, even if I'm strategic about it, ride my motorbike. But if I'm gonna sit down at my desk and do two hours of writing, editing, or emails and phone calls, that's gonna smash me up. And I need to be really careful planning what else I do in that day. So with my cognitive impairments, I need to plan what might be reasonable on any given day. Let's say I need to write the script for this film. Well, in that case, I need to avoid any unnecessary emails or phone calls or any other distractions and minimize screen time on anything else so that I've got the maximum amount of energy to put into that task I'm trying to do. But then I still need to be careful. As soon as I feel my head starting to go a bit wobbly, I need to go and lie down or the consequences are going to be even more severe. For reference, to get to this point in the script, took me three and a half days. Pre-COVID, I'd have been able to do the whole thing in a morning without too much trouble. 
Let's say that in your case, you're actually more sensitive to physical exertion. In that case, on the days you need to be mobile, you need to think carefully about what else you do and maybe create space on the days before and after to give yourself the extra rest, requ rest required to be able to actually deal with it. Here's basically what we're dealing with. The activities of daily living, so washing, eating, shopping, breathing, uh, manage basic management of relationships, let's say they take 20% of your normal daily energy budget. Pre-COVID, uh, you would have 80% left to do with whatever you want, work, play, uh, live. Only now your long COVID energy budget is 25% and you've still got to breathe, wash, eat, do the shopping. So now you've only got 5% less to spend. That's 16 times less than you used to have. Understand what uses up that balance and recognize that things you never previously thought might have been tiring now have to be taken into consideration. Essentially what I'm talking about here is pacing. Uh, Paul Garner gave me a hard time after correctly identifying that I wasn't doing it well enough. So I thought it best that I invite him to contribute a few words. It requires us to limit our expenditure to allow our bodies to convalesce and get better. You must limit um, and measure the amount of emotional energy that you consume, avoiding stressful situations, the amount of physical energy you consume, particularly li limiting your exercise to short walks, and the amount of mental uh, energy that you consume in work or in Zoom calls um, and other activities that require you to think. Now let's say the pacing has been going well for a few days and you're thinking of increasing exertion, be it physical or cognitive. The trick here is to go slow, be incremental and ultimately expect relapses. When those relapses happen, rest as much as you can and don't give yourself a hard time. Relapses with long COVID uh, can be induced by overexertion, but sometimes they're just gonna come for you anyway. One final practical recommendation, and that is sleep. Sleep as much as you can, as often as you can. Yes, it might not be as restful as it used to be, um, but it's still the best tool we've got to actually managing the long COVID fatigue, headaches, dizziness, brain fog type symptoms. My most recent study has shown that the vast majority of long haulers currently feel unable to go back to work in a normal capacity. I am amongst them. Uh, since March, I have had one freelance shoot day. Uh, it was a cool project, a creative freedom, small crew, uh, and I wanted to do it. But shoots are hard. I left home at nine o'clock and I got home just before midnight. It was 15 hours straight physical and cognitive exertion with very little in the way of breaks. The next day was horrendous, and the day after that was a write-off too. Simply not sustainable or sensible. So what does the UK government say about it? Understand reasonable adjustments and have a graded return to work. Two days a week for the first week, three days a week on the second and third week, four days a week on the fourth and fifth weeks, and full time in week six. If you've had a serious illness and have persistent fatigue, then this may be too fast. And depending on what your job is, this may not be possible either. Are you a surgeon or an airline pilot? Good luck. There are no easy answers here. If you're self-employed or can work flexible hours from home, then a staggered return to work might be possible. But for everyone else, it's pretty difficult. Let's hope that both the government and employers understand the condition going forwards, because the numbers affected are going to be absolutely huge. So in conclusion, how do you recover from long COVID? Bloody good question. And nobody really has the answer. The one thing I would say is that it's probably fairly safe to say you are far, far, far better off trying to rest yourself better than trying to push yourself into some kind of recovery. Rest, patience and mindfulness are probably some of the best tools we've got in this battle, but none of them are easy. One final note, in the interests of recovering from long COVID, this channel was always going to be about some other stuff. So don't be surprised if I finally get around to editing the running films I shot back in February or bits and bobs with engines and wheels that I have done since. A touch of respite from me sitting in this chair and wittering about the virus, perhaps. Till next time.